Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this event. My name is Gina Samra, and I'm currently an acting vice principal with the Peel District School Board. The guest presenter for this session is Sean Libbard, who is a Pan-African entrepreneur, a community builder, a father, a listener, a thinker, an educator, and a personal mastery coach. As a valued member of the Knowledge Bookstore family, he is committed to providing the tools to promote racial and cultural pride and is dedicated to learning, sharing, and teaching the true history and culture of Africans worldwide. Sean believes that a book isn't just a book, it is a gift of power. Additionally, books awaken the mind, which is both the bookstore slogan and Sean's goal. Knowledge Bookstore is located in Brampton and serves as a community space where African history and culture come alive, as well as the go-to for products, services, and events that promote cultural pride, self-love, and a knowledge of self. And on that note, I will invite Sean to begin his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Okay, so today I will be speaking about parent power to awareness. All right. I'd just like to add a few things about myself. Um, I've been here in Brampton, actually yesterday, yesterday made 40 years since I've been in Canada. All right. I went to the school system here in Brampton. I attended Centennial Middle School in Brampton Centennial and I finished my schooling at Ryerson University. All right. The most important thing I learned in high school was when I was introduced to four African-American writers, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Alice Walker, and Langston Hughes. This introduction came to my grade 13 English teacher, Mrs. Morton. And Mrs. Morton, she pulled me aside and she told me to go to the library and research these four authors and to choose one of them to do my independence studies, presentation, and paper. That was a game changer for me. Because for the first time, I was actually introduced to African American authors. I didn't know about any of those authors previously. And I chose Langston Hughes. The library had more material from him. And I started reading his poetry. And for the first time, I actually enjoyed poetry. Right, so I read his poetry. He had novels, he had plays. I read his biography. And honestly, it is the only presentation I think I did throughout high school that I actually wanted to do and look forward to. Because Langston Hughes' work resonated with me so much. And that started me on a journey of discovering more and more African authors. Right? In Canada, in the US, you know, in the Caribbean and in Africa. And that's how I got to this place that I am right now as a bookstore owner. Today we're speaking about education. And I have I have a daughter, her name is Azana. She's 11 years old, she'll be 12 in November. And I chose to homeschool Azana. Right, so I've been homeschooling Azana all of her life for all 11 years. Now, one of the first things that was important to me is to determine exactly what education is. Because we use the word, but do we do we need to question what it is to us? And this is going to be different for each of us. It depends on our individual goals, right? But we need to know what it is and what do we expect from it? And during my studies, there's a few of my teachers, Dr. Amos Wilson, and Dr. Amos Wilson taught 
that the ultimate goal of education is to secure the survival of a people. And he went even further and he asked the question, what kind of Africans do we need to raise to solve the problems that we are currently facing? All right. So with Dr. Amos's definition of education and the question that he placed forward, that started me on a journey of what do I need to teach my daughter that I wasn't taught at an early age so that she can not only be useful to herself, but useful to her community. I come in from, and when I speak, I will speak from an African perspective because that's where, that's who I am. And so everything that I speak about will come from that perspective. Now, I'm also entangled with European culture because I was educated to a European system and most of my education, even in the Caribbean, you know, we were colonized by the English. So most of that education came from Britain, right? We, so I will speak from an African perspective and from someone who has chosen to re-educate himself once he exist, exited the system, the school system, right? So one of the most important thing I think that needs to be addressed immediately and for parents is I speak to a lot of parents and a lot of times I don't think parents realize that they're the first educator of a child. Right? Parents, you are the first educator of a child. As a matter of fact, you're supposed to prepare your children to go into the system of education. As the first educator of a child, we have the responsibility to create a learning environment. And as someone who wasn't a trained teacher and taking on the challenge of educating my daughter, one of the first things I did is I seeked out, I seeked out experts in the area of education and there's a gentleman, an elder gentleman, Fred Smite, and he does a series called, uh, it's a free series called Fred, where it's about a six-year-old student who is a university professor. And what I liked about his books is that he taught science, math, uh, sociology, you know, he taught everything within stories, short, simple stories. Each chapter of the books were about two pages. And within those two pages, children were learning educational concepts, whether it was in science, it was in math, you know, uh, it was social studies. They were learning these concepts without it being said that we're doing math. It was just a story that was being read and those concepts were being relayed within the story. Now, I interviewed Mr. Smites and one of the things that he said to me, the most important thing he said to me that I really appreciated was he said to me that he is known as a math teacher and some call him a math genius, but he doesn't teach math. He teaches children. And when he said that to me, it hit me immediately what he was saying. It is not about the subject. It is about the child. The child should come first. So when we are teaching our children, it's about 
the child that's before us at that very moment. It's not about the success we are looking for in the future. It's not about any of those things right now. It's not about us. It's about that specific child that's sitting in front of us that we are in the process of teaching. Right? And that was something that was very important because it placed a lot of things into perspective and it also made me introspect. I had to examine myself because usually we we do things the same way we learn them. And I went to a school system that was done in a, a, the same way that it had been done for the last 50 years. And that's what I knew. And that's, I had to be conscious of that, that I didn't try to teach my daughter in the same way that I was taught. Now, as with everything, there is always, there's always things that you can also use. I had excellent teachers and I remember all the teachers that I felt was excellent teachers throughout, you know, my educational process. And I thought about the things that they did well that I appreciated and that I benefited from. And those are things that I also instilled within myself and tried my best to practice on a daily basis. Right. So one of the things that parents need to do is to get to know the child that's before you. And I know most parents will say, yes, I know my child, but I mean, know the child from their perspective, not from your perspective. Observe, and we have the ability to observe and to see what our children enjoys naturally from what we try to push on them. Right? Because that's been part of education. You need to know this, you need to know it by this time and so forth. And those are things that I personally feel needs to be changed. And I think parents have the ability to do, to make those changes, to make those assessments within their children. And if you have more than one child, they are going to have different personalities. And you have to be able to recognize that and to use that as part of your teaching strategies. Right. One of the other things that I think is necessary for parents to realize is whether you're homeschooling your child full time, you have your child in private school, public school, it doesn't matter. You need to be actively involved in your child's education. You need to be present. Right? You need to be present. As I've seen this in the school system. When I first opened this business, I went into the schools and there were times that children were doing um, like a Black History Month event and there was very few parents that were present. Very few parents, right? So you need to be actively involved. You need to be questioning what your child is learning and how your child is being taught. And those are your responsibility. In the early years, as parents, we influence our children and children learn by observation in the early years. So whether we think of ourselves as a teacher or not, we are teaching our children because they're watching everything that we do. They're watching what we say. They are watching, you know, they're hearing what we say, I should say, right? And the imagery and so forth that we provide for them will also influence them. What we watch in TV, everything becomes an influence. 
And these are things we need to be conscious of. One of the things that I did when my daughter was first born is I set up a room and I called it the learning room. And I would tell her this is the learning room. And within that room, I have had all the letters of the alphabet. I had numbers on the wall. I had colors, fruits. I had the periodic charts. Right? So I had a set of things that I wanted my daughter to be able to see. And, you know, at nights, because she was up at nights quite a bit. She didn't like sleeping. So I would take her to those posters and I would speak to her about what's there, whether it's telling her the different colors, uh, uh, pronouncing words, right? I would do that. I also read a lot of books to her during that period of time. This is where education starts. In African, in African philosophy, education starts at the time of creation. From the time you know that you're pregnant, that's when education should start at the time of conception, right? Education shouldn't start five, six years later. And there's a lot of parents that do wait for that time, right? Children are learning all throughout that time. Children are curious throughout that time. And you have the ability to, for the first five years before their personality sets in, you have the ability to set a foundation and to help your child to absorb certain important educational facts that you would like to set that foundation for. So all of this is simply to say that parents play an important, a very important, and a lot of times I don't feel like parents understand the importance of their role in education. Because as parents, if, I, if my child is going to the school system, I'm preparing my child for the school system. I'm preparing, I'm teaching my child respect. I am teaching my child the values that they should have when they walk into a class, right? I was fortunate to have that from my parents. So even when I transitioned to Canada and it was a cultural shock, I was still able to live by the values that my parents had instilled in me. All right. So I just want it to be absolutely clear that parents pay, play a very important role in the child's success in education. And it, we can have all the dreams, all the plans we have, we want for our children if we're not actively involved, it will hurt them. It will hurt their chances, right? So that's the first portion of what I'm speaking about now that parents, hopefully you understand and the importance of your role. The second aspect that I would like to speak about that I find to be very important is knowledge of self. And for me, knowledge of self, a great example is Carter G. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson, for those of you who are not familiar with the name, he is known as the father of black history. He was the gentleman that petitioned for what was called Negro History Month and eventually became Black History Month. Carter G. Woodson, he graduated from Harvard and he was the second Black PhD from Harvard 
where W.E. Du Bois was the first. And what Carter G. Woodson discovered after he, he had completed his PhD at Harvard is that he was educated away from himself. The education he had, he got was more training for him to keep his community in ignorance. And once Carter G. Woodson came to that realization, he went on a journey of trying to discover African history. And all of the books he was reading was saying that Africans had contributed nothing to this world. And <laughs> he dug his heels in and he continued researching and researching until he started finding information, you know, that showed the contributions of Africans to this world. And Carter G. Woodson, he shifted and he started doing home studies courses for his community. He started a journal where he was writing about different Africans and African people in the diaspora who had made tremendous contribution to the world. So Carter G. Woodson, when he, he didn't know himself. He didn't know himself. And that set him on a journey. There are many of us who do not know ourselves historically. We do not have our historical awareness and we do not know ourselves culturally. And that's something that is very important for us to know who we are and where we came from. One of the simplest exercises you can do with your child, something that, something that uh, identifies, gives this, your child a sense of identity, is a name. Names are important in the African culture. And many of us from the African culture do not have names that reflect our culture. My name is Sean. Sean is an Irish name that means glory of God. And, and my middle name is Ian. And that's a Scottish name that essentially means the same thing and both translate to John, right? Now, this is where education comes in because I questioned how I got my names and I learned it was my eldest sister who was living in England and she was a fan of Sean Connery, um, the, the James Bond. And so I got Sean from Sean Connery and Ian from Ian Fleming. Now, those names are not of my culture, but they actually worked for me in the sense that Ian Fleming was a writer and I got into the business of literature, right? So it worked for me, but it wasn't going to work for my daughter. So I name my daughter's name is Azana. Azana is Azana came from Azania. Azania was the name, the ancient name for South Africa. Azana means the ultimate. And that's one of the first things that I taught her. Where her name came from and the meaning of her name and the importance of the meaning of her name because she can live that meaning and when others tell us something different, she knows who she is. Her middle name is Zamora, and that comes from North Africa. And Zamora means courageous and brave of heart. She also knows that. Right? So these aren't just labels that she wears, 
there are names with a meaning and a meaning that reminds her of who she is. So this is a simple exercise you can do with your children. And if you don't know the name of your, the meaning of the, your child's name, you can make one up. You can make one up. We have to be creative with things. And also, I have, like I said, I have a Scottish and Irish name. But if I want to go by an African name, I take Kwabena, because Kwabena, Kwabena is my day name. The day I was born, I was born on a Tuesday. And in the African culture for each day of the week, there is a male name for each day of the week and a female name. So I can also use Kwabena. All right. So these are simple exercises that you can incorporate in everyday life. And every child should know the meaning of their name because when you know the meaning of your name, it, it helps you to remember who you are. And children will always be in spaces where someone will try to tell them who they are. So it's very important that they know who they are from the get-go. Knowledge of self also comes to, in the African tradition, storytelling. Storytelling and their storytellers and elders are an excellent source of stories. So if there's elders in the family, it's always good to have your children sit with those elders and children naturally question. They naturally ask questions, they're naturally curious. So they can sit with those elders and elders naturally tell stories also. They do that. So, you know, it is good for children to sit and listen to the elders and to listen to stories of the past and to get to know things that they didn't know. I do that on a daily basis with my daughter. We take a nature walk every morning before we start lessons. And I speak to her about my childhood because her childhood is very different to my childhood. I grew up in a community where I knew all of my neighbors and from the time I left my home, I had to say good morning to every adult on the way to school. Whether I saw them visually or not, as long as I was passing their home, I had to say good morning. And that's how we were raised in the Caribbean. It's a little bit different here, but it is important. It is important for, for us to understand the culture and where the culture started, right? And how it's evolved. Right. So it is knowledge of self, I think children need to know who they are. They need to know their ancestral self because we are connected as African people. We are very diverse people with a very diverse culture. And at the same time, as diverse as our culture is, it comes from the same place. We are connected culturally because we have the same ancestry. And that is something that our children need to understand because we have African people that lives in on the continent and in the diaspora so whether it is in South America, North America, 
the Caribbean, uh, in Europe, most of us are connected to a common culture. And an easy lesson plan when dealing with culture is for a child to look at African people that spread all over the globe and to see the differences that exist within the culture that each of us are part of, the subculture that we're each a part of, and to be able to examine the reason why someone speaks French, someone else speaks Spanish, someone else speaks English, and someone else may speak an indigenous African language. Right. So in this exercise, a child will learn that although there is diversity within the culture, it doesn't change the fact that we came from the same culture, but our culture has also been disrupted. And that's the reason for some of these differences that we see today. Right. So, knowledge of self. It is also a good idea to create rituals and celebrations around our culture and history or culture and history. I celebrate Victoria Day is coming up and to be quite honest, Queen Victoria is of no importance to me. So I substitute to that holiday and I use an African that has contributed to my life and that's what myself and my family will celebrate. Because that's what's culturally appropriate for us. It is not for us to maintain the same things that's been celebrated that has nothing to do with us. And these are lessons that you can teach a child, you can examine the holidays that we do celebrate and the relevance of those holidays to us as African people and to get their feedback and how they see these holidays that's being celebrated. So knowledge of self is another important pivotal aspect in preparing your child for the future, for success, to navigate their way through life. Culture, I mentioned culture. Culture is huge. Now culture is language, spiritual systems, religions, um, art forms, right? Um, art forms, a way of living, right? Culture encompasses whole bunch of stuff. It encompasses history. And it is, the, the African culture is very rich. It's very rich. There is, and now I'm speaking about strategies and different ways you can teach the culture. One of the a cultural celebration that we have Kwanzaa and Kwanzaa takes place from December 26 to 
December 26 to January 1st, and there's seven principles in Kwanzaa. And those principles can be used 24 seven. It's Kwanzaa shouldn't, those principles should not just be used during the Kwanzaa period. As with all the holidays, it is, it is the focus period that you can do that, but the Kwanzaa principles can be incorporated into daily life. The first principle of Kwanzaa is unity, Moshe, and that principle encourages unity within the community. And the simple assignment would be is for children is how do you create unity within your community, within your family, with your friends, when there is differences? How do you do that? And these assignments, these exercises can be done in many different ways. They can be done in the written format. They can be done to poetry. They can be done to music. My daughter Zana, she likes art, so that's a form that she can use to express her feelings on unity. I'm not going to go through all of the principles. Um, there is unity, there is cooperative economics, there is collective working responsibility, self-determination, purpose, uh, creativity, and faith. Right? And each one of these have a Swahili name that goes with it. And it's also a beautiful way to learn some of some words from the Swahili language that children can pick up, right? So each concept in Kwanzaa has that. It has a Swahili name because Kwanzaa came out of Swahili, came out of the first festival in Africa. Right? That is one way of teaching culture and within the Kwanzaa principles, you will touch on, you will touch in history, you will touch in culture, you will touch on spirituality, which is something that's very important, and that's a parent's job, a parent's responsibility in teaching their child. It is definitely a parent's job where spirituality is concerned. Now, another simple way of teaching culture that existed both in Africa and the Caribbean is true proverbs. Is true proverbs. Um, there is a lot of African proverbs and you can do a full lesson and a simple African proverb and the meaning of the proverb and it can also evolve into other things right? because proverbs are almost like word puzzles that we have to figure out. In the Caribbean, the elders would use such proverbs and there were words of wisdom. And a lot of times we didn't get it until we were much older. So it is, proverbs is an excellent tool to also pass on the culture and to teach life lessons at the same time and to share African wisdom. Symbolism is also another important aspect. There is a symbol, this Sankofa. Sankofa is a concept 
and there's a symbol that goes with it. The concept of Sankofa encourages us to journey back into the past and take what is empowering, what you can use today, and come back forward with that and use it in the present. Right? So history is part of Sankofa. You study history to learn, to learn about historical achievements of a people. And you take that history and you use it as a source of empowerment today. Right? So the concept of Sankofa, the symbol of Sankofa is a bird that is, the head is looking backwards into the past. Right. We also have out of West Africa, there is the Adinka symbols and there is a lot of those. And each of those symbols has a meaning. Some, some symbols will, will convey unity. Some will be wisdom, education, um, cooperativeness. There is different symbols. There's quite a bit of them, but those symbols can also be studied. Symbolism is a huge part of African culture, and those symbols can be studied and used as lessons that, you know, for our children and used on a daily basis. If you enter knowledge bookstore, you will see those symbols as you come through the front door they're painted on the floor, right? Because symbolism is important. And again, it reminds, it reminds you of who you are. It reminds you of the values that you represent. And these are things that we need to instill in our children. Right? So, in looking at that culture can be taught in many ways. I haven't I haven't even touched on reading yet. There is many, many areas that can be touched on. Um, cultivating genius, if you can see that um, by the doctor, Muhammad. It's an excellent book that she has taken, she has studied reading societies that existed, African American reading societies that existed in the early 1800s. And she's taken what those reading societies did with reading, which was predominantly their read books and their, their wrote articles, they debated, um, they, they used it as a source to compare to other cultures and so forth. But she has examined it and she has developed various lesson plans that you can use to teach African children and children, period, you know, based on reading specific literature, specific types of literature, which usually falls in the category of self-love, again, history and culture, right? So this is, it's, this book is an excellent source for that in developing curriculum around the books that you're reading and how to, to develop a curriculum that just doesn't simply focus on what you've read, 
but to be able to see how it connects to other subjects. So whether it is science, uh, it is math, uh, it is sociology, right? how it connects to different aspects from one simple topic. Right? So there is many resources that's available to parents and teachers that deals with being teaching culturally responsive lessons, culturally responsive lessons to the children or students, right? My focus today was really to give parents a few ideas that they can use in creating lessons for their children at home. And one of the other things that I think is very important about that is, as I said, get to know your child and make sure that the lessons are things that's fun. Find fun ways of doing it. When you're teaching at home, it's, it doesn't have to be like in school. You don't have to sit at a desk. You don't have to play by the same rules. You can do it more creatively, more spontaneously. And you can engage your child. And as always, a lesson isn't a lesson until you connect it to how it can be implemented in life. And as students, that's usually the aspect that, you know, challenges most students is what purpose does this serve in my life? And I think that's one of the things that with every lesson plan, there should be a practical application, right? With every book that you read, there should be a practical application. There should be something that you can immediately apply to your life that makes it better, that improves you in some way, uh, enhances you in some form. And it's the same thing. That's what's necessary for our children to be able to teach them these things at a young age. That you don't have to remember the story and you can regurgitate the story. No, it goes a little bit deeper than that. How can I use the concepts within this book within my life? And that's what I focus on teaching my daughter is to how to use her mind to how to use her mind to find ways to instill the lessons into her life and to see how that can empower her on her journey. Right? Now, these were just a few quick suggestions what I'm speaking about here, it, it is something that's a lot more in depth and honestly, each thing can be a presentation on its own that takes some time. And uh, I just wanted to touch in a few different areas and to share a few things that may be helpful. And also, please do remember, use your own creativity. You don't have to do things, the exact same things that I mentioned, but the idea is to be able to come up with your own ideas. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that just by speaking about certain things that it will, it will, it will 
help you to create your own ideas, right? So I'm going to leave it at that for now because I see the time. And if there's any questions, I will take those for the remaining time. So I uh, thank you for thank you for having me. I uh, thank you for being present. And if there's any questions, please do let me know. Okay. Let's, let me see. Okay. Okay, so I see there's a question from Nicolette. Um, what are the methods in which we can purchase product from your store? Nicolette, right now you can purchase online at knowledgebookstore.com as we are only open for curbside pickup at the moment. Um, we'll have to wait and see what happens on June 2nd to see if we will be allowed to do in-store again. But for now, it is online purchasing. Or you can give us a call. You can give us a call, 905-459-9875, and we can help you on the phone also, right? Okay, I think that's the only question I saw. I think that I was think the only one yes. that I saw that as I well. Saw, I saw. Okay. So I just wanted I just to, thank to thank you so much, so Shai, much Shai, 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 uh, for joining for us joining today. today. I, I just I, um, want to thank you so much for sharing your Saturday with all of us. Uh, thank you for sharing your story, your resources, and your insights that, that celebrate and reflect African culture, history, contributions, and pride. Thank you um, so much. I, I, I absolutely agree with your sentiments, Sean, of knowing our students and knowing them from their perspectives and helping our students in their journey of understanding and discovering and celebrating themselves, their culture, and their histories. Thank you so much to our parent community for joining us today in this engaging presentation that Sean um, shared with us. Um, I know as a school, we will continue to partner with Sean and to reach out to him um, as we audit and build on the resources that reflect the lived experiences of all of our students and especially our African uh, community and culture. Just want to say to um, all of our families to please remember to support local and support your child's learning of African culture and pride through Sean and Knowledge Bookstores located downtown Brampton at 117 Queen Street. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you so much, Sean. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank here. you. I know you've got lots uh, lots more to share, and I hope uh, uh, that our families are able to reach out to, to Sean uh, through the bookstore, and I, I'm sure he's happy to continue on these conversations um, that can't obviously be covered just within the hour. So thank you again, Sean. And um, to everyone else uh, that attended today, we do have another session starting or several sessions starting at two. So if you want to uh, just take a quick break and uh, remember to join us back here um, at two. Thank you so much. Thank you.